softly and tenderly Jesus is calling calling for you and for me see on the portals he's waving and watching watching for you and for me come home come home ye who are weary come home and earnestly tender is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not His mercies, mercies for you and for me? Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love He has promised, promised for you and for me. And though we have sinned, He has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Good morning, everyone. Um, before we, we begin the service, I just want to take a few moments here to thank all of you for your prayers, your cards, your calls, your offers to help. Some of you even made the, the trek all the way over here to Maricopa to bring us some food and some soup and that sort of stuff. It was greatly appreciated. Lynn and I are about 95% of the way back and feeling much better and stronger day by day. I also want to thank Jay, uh, especially for filling in these past three weeks. And even today, when I'm done here, I'll send him the recording and he'll put all the components together to make it a nice service for you. He has been and is indeed currently a blessing to Trinity and to me. So thank you, Jay. You know, as we uh, gather to, together today, the thought comes to mind of when someone calls you on your phone, do you always answer? In our present day with identification, uh, caller identification, many people are apt to let the call go to voicemail, to wait and see uh, what the message is and who it's from, and then to respond depending upon that level of importance. How about when God calls, especially if that call is one to repentance? Do you answer? We hear in today's readings of the response of some people. Jonah, the reluctant follower, he went to Nineveh begrudgingly, but through him God would issue a call to the Ninevites to repentance. Jesus would call Simon, Andrew, James, and John to follow him and promised that, that through them God would issue a call of repentance to many. In baptism, God calls has called us to follow him in a life of faith and repentance. And he promises that through us, others will be called to that same repentance and new life. So let's begin in, with a word of prayer. Gracious Christ, you came to the fishermen after John the Baptist was taken away. Come to us now as we fear losses of our own. Grant us courage to cast aside the nets that bind us, to follow you into true freedom and newness of life. Help us to be faithful disciples that we might inspire others to follow in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
So let us begin then. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We confess, gracious Lord, by your name, you have called us to be your own, and we are to pray, praise, and give thanks to you that we often do not live as you have called us to live as your own. We do not always honor your name nor your calling with our praise. We confess our sins to God in repentance, turning from those things that lead us away, turning back to you as we follow in faith. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Hear and rejoice in the good news. Jesus Christ died for you, and for his sake, God has compassion. As a called servant of the word and in his stead, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading is recorded in the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and 10. And here again, the Lord is causing Jonah the reluctant prophet, to um, preach to the Ninevites for repentance, and they do repent. We begin at verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. When God saw what they did, how they had turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, we'll have a children's message. Hey, everyone. It's good to be together with you this weekend. It's uh, time for our children's lesson, as Dennis said. And uh, interesting fact about Jesus calling us. Uh, Dennis called me as we were hiking in uh, Sedona. We were up at the Cathedral Rock. Uh, you can see a picture right up here. I'll edit it in later. Uh, the... Uh, it was a wonderful time, and I should have recorded this when I was up there. I didn't think about it until we're driving home uh, and, and thinking about, oh, you know, about Jesus calling us wherever we are, whenever it happens, and, and the amazing ways that God works in our lives, uh, even in, in moments that can seem inconsequential to us, that God is at work in our lives and our hearts no matter where we are, no matter what's going on around us. And that's an amazing and beautiful thing. And, and this amazing moment where the disciples just drop everything they're doing and follow Jesus. So enjoy this video together with your, your family at this moment. And uh, we look forward to sharing it with you again next week. Stories of the Bible. Jesus calls Peter. This is Jesus. hey -o! who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Jesus grew up in Nazareth hey, and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. Jesus began teaching about God's love and healing people of their sickness. One day, John saw Jesus walking by and told the people around him that Jesus was the Lamb of God. One of the people standing with him was Andrew, whose brother was Simon, who would later be known as Peter. Andrew went to find his brother and said, We have found the Christ! Whoa! Ray? Come on! Simon went with Andrew and met Jesus. Uh-huh. I'm Simon. Jesus looked at Simon and said, Your name is Simon, son of John. Yes, it is. But you will be called Peter. Uh, okay. On another day, Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and lots of people crowded around him to hear what he had to say. Oh, uh, uh, hello. Well, oh, okay. Jesus noticed two empty boats for Andrew and Peter had left them and were washing their nets. 
Jesus stepped into one of the boats and asked Peter to take him out into the sea. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Peter, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. But Peter said, We worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. Whoa! They called to some other fishermen for help. Hey, help! And soon both boats were filled with fish. When Peter realized what happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. Jesus replied to Peter, Don't be afraid. Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Really? Really. And as soon as they landed, they left their nets and followed Jesus. So Simon Peter became one of Jesus' 12 disciples and followed his friend Jesus throughout his time on earth. Our second reading is recorded in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 7, verses 29 through 31, and Paul is encouraging us to use our time wisely. We begin at verse 29. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading for today is recorded in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20, and it is the call of Jesus' first four disciples. We begin at verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, they, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please pray with me from Psalm 19, verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You may have heard the story about the fisherman who had a fantastic reputation for his ability to catch fish. Every day he would go out in his boat and bring back an incredibly large number of fish, and his reputation spread far and wide. One day, a stranger came into the camp and wanted to go fishing with him. The fisherman said, well, come to back tomorrow morning at 4.30 and we'll go. The stranger was back the next morning, and the two men got into the boat. Now, the stranger was a little puzzled at what he saw. All the fishermen carried was an old rusty green tackle box and a dip net. There were no fishing poles, casting rods, reels, none of the paraphernalia normally associated with fishing. They motored across the lake and got back into a little secluded cove. The fisherman then opened his rusty tackle box and pulled out a red stick of dynamite. He took a match, very casually struck it, as the stranger's eyes grew wider. 
He lit the fuse and tossed the stick casually over his shoulder into the water. When the dynamite exploded into the water, the fish began rising to the surface. Well, very calmly then, the fisherman began dipping into the water and putting the fish into the boat with his dip net. The stranger then reached into his pocket, pulled out a worn leather billfold, opened it up to reveal a shiny metal badge. He was the game warden. And he goes, you're under arrest. It's against the law to dynamite for fish. Again, very calmly, the fisherman reached down into his old rusty green tackle bags, box and pulled out a second stick of dynamite. He struck a match, lit the fuse, and then handed the stick of the dynamite to the game warden. Well, the game warden was so surprised and confused that he actually took it, and the fuse was in his hand burning. And the fisherman, with a, a gleam in his eye and a little bit of glee in his voice, said, are you going to fish, or are you going to just sit there? Our scripture lesson today is about some fishermen. It is the familiar story of Jesus' call of the four disciples, all fishermen. Mark gives a specific setting for the call of only one other disciple, and that is Matthew, the tax collector. Then in chapter 3, he names the original 12 whom Jesus called, but gives no details as, as to their calling. We focus today on the call of those first four fishermen because there are challenging lessons here for us. I titled the sermon, Fish or Cut Bait, and if you're familiar with the phrase, you'll know that it's usually in the form of a question. Are you going to fish or cut bait? Meaning, are you going to spend your time getting ready or are you going to get on with the task at hand? It could also mean the time has come. We can't dilly-dally around any longer. We have to act now or there'll be no chance for action. Fish or cut bait expresses a kind of urgency, a call to decision. It signals momentous opportunity. So let's look again at our gospel with that idea as the backdrop for our thinking. First of all, the first lesson is anyone can be a follower of Jesus. Note first the, the simple fact that the men Jesus called were fishermen. They were simple folk. They did not come from schools and colleges. They were not leaders in their church or part of the aristocracy. They were neither learned nor wealthy. They were fishermen. That is to say, they were just ordinary people. No one believed in the ordinary as much as Jesus did. Once in a, a fit of temper, Scottish historian Thomas Carlyle declared, there are 27 million people in England mostly fools. Jesus did not feel like that. Lincoln took his cue from G what Jesus had said. And Lincoln once said, God must love the common people. He made so many of them. It was as if Jesus had said, just give me 12 ordinary men. And with them, if they will give themselves to me, I will change the world. And as we look at these men whom Jesus called to be his disciples, certain truths can stand out. Most prominently is that in choosing ordinary men, it means that anyone can be a follower of Jesus. This is a heartening fact for the person who feels incapable or unworthy. And there are far more people in those categories than we usually want to acknowledge people who feel incapable of living the Christian life, of following Jesus, of taking responsibility uh, in his kingdom work. Isn't it great that being a Christian disciple is dependent neither upon our ability or our, our worthiness? Anyone can be a follower of Jesus. And that leads us to the second truth that stands out from Jesus' calling of ordinary men, and that is the kingdom's advance is not dependent upon our normal perceptions of power. No word captures that truth better than the word from Zechariah, the word that came to him in a vision when the angel of the Lord spoke to him 
He said, not by might, nor, nor by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord God of hosts. Paul gave the, the best picture of, of this when he wrote to the, the Corinthians. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. You see, the kingdom's advance is not dependent upon our normal perceptions of power. God uses our weakness, our limitation, even our failures to bring about his good. So let me repeat two things we conclude from the fact that the first people Jesus called were just ordinary common people, common fishermen. First, anyone can be a follower. And second, the kingdom's advance is not dependent upon our normal perception of power. And that leads us to the third point. But note the call itself in verse 17. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. So first of all, this is a call to join Jesus, to be with him. The follow me call of Jesus is an offer of companionship. To walk the same road is the meaning of that word. The case of the Greek word carries with it the idea of joining with someone, fellowship, joint participation, a side-by-side -side communion with another. That is the key to what we are talking about here. Faith begins not when we accept a set of teachings, nor when we embrace a particular lifestyle, nor when we subscribe to a certain ethic. The Christian faith and our discipleship begins when we meet Jesus in our own hearts, pour out our love to him from the depths of our being, and begin to walk with him. There's a story told um, about a, a Dr. J. Edwin Orr. He was a Baptist theologian in the early 20th century, and he was speaking to a group of college students on precisely this topic. And when he was done with his lecture, a young woman stood up and she said, I object. If a person believes in communism, he's a communist. If he believes in socialism, he's a socialist. If he believes in capitalism, he's a capitalist. And if he believes in Christianity, he's a Christian. Dr. Orr slowly shook his head and said, no, that's not necessarily so. And the woman was a little puzzled and didn't understand. So Dr. Orr happened to look down and see on her, her hand that she had an engagement ring on her uh, on her finger and he said tell me something do you believe in marriage and the young girl said well believe in marriage well yes of course i do in fact i'm engaged to be married this summer to a, a young man who goes to another university and dr orr said well that's that's really wonderful i wonder if i could ask you to to do something for me come down and just stand up here on the on the stage with me and as she was coming down Dr. Orr spotted a young man in the back corner of the room. He asked the man to also come forward. And as the young man was coming forward, he said to him, young man, let me ask you something. Do you believe in marriage? And the young man replied, well, yeah, I believe in marriage. I'm not planning to get married anytime soon. But he, know, he said, I know that someday I will get married. I believe in marriage. And Dr. Orgos, he says, I am just delighted to hear that both of you believe in marriage. Now, let me ask the two of you to do something. Will you please take and hold one another's hand? And after, couple, after the couple did that, 
uncertain what would happen next, Dr. Orr then took his hands and put them around their joined hands. And then he said, since the two of you have both indicated that you believe in marriage, and since I'm a fully ordained minister and my credentials are registered in this state, I hereby pronounce you man and wife. Whoa, wait a minute, the woman declared, you can't do that. Dr. Orr said, I can't? Why not? And the young woman said, well, because marriage is not a, a philosophy, it's a relationship, a very personal and special relationship at that. I don't even know this guy. Dr. Orr said, you know, you're right. It is a very special and personal relationship. And so it is with Christianity. Christianity is not a philosophy at all, but it is a very special and personal relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Now, of course, it's important that we believe in the teachings and the principles of our faith. It's important that we embrace our Christian lifestyle, that we honor the Christian ethic, and that we uphold a Christian value system. But the key, the key is to know Jesus personally in our hearts and to love him fully with all of our being to respond to him when he says, to be my disciple, you must love me. Jesus wants our total commitment. In Matthew, Jesus said, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So, Anyone can be a follower. The kingdom's advance is not dependent upon our normal perception of power. And the call is a call to join Jesus. But the call is also a task to be a fisher of men. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Note the imperative in Jesus' call. I will make you. That's strong and direct language. The follower of Jesus has no choice. He is a fisher of men. The term that Jesus used in his call to the disciples in Greek literally means to become, that is, to, to come into existence, to begin to be. In one commentary, it stated that it meant to catch fish in such a way that what they were going, that the fish were going to still be alive when they were brought to shore for sale. Now these four fishermen were to become fishers of men in the same way. They were to be able to share the good news of Jesus so that others would arrive in eternity with full life. It's amazing, isn't it? The intended fruit of one Christian is another. That is, we are to bring others to Jesus. Jesus put it clearly when he said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Fruitfulness is not a luxury. It is a requirement. The qualification is not just believing in Christ, but it is be, in being productive. How do we do that? We do it by loving people selflessly, speaking to them of God's love and mercy. How do we do it? We do it not of our own gifts alone, but with the guidance and inspiration of the Spirit. Jesus said, I will make you become fishers of men. Not only does that suggest an imperative, it suggests that Jesus will equip us for this witnessing task. We will not be left without the right word if we will depend on God. And when the words don't come, our presence will be more powerful than words. For the Holy Spirit will be and will do through us what is needed in that moment. The call is clear. Fish or cut bait. 
follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Remember these truths and mark them clearly in your mind. Anyone can be a follower of Jesus. The kingdom's advance is not dependent upon our normal perceptions of power. The call is to join Jesus, to be with him. But the call is also a task, to be a fisher of men. I came across a poem by an unknown author who spoke of his spiritual journey. It's a journey that God calls each of us to make. The poem written in the late 19th century goes like this. I walked life's way with a careless tread. I followed where comfort and pleasure led till at last one day in a quiet place, I met my master face to face. I reared my castles and built them high till their turrets touched the blue of the sky. And I vowed to rule with an iron mace when I met my master face to face. I met him and knew him and blushed to see that his eyes in pity were fixed on me. And I faltered and fell at his feet that day and my castles melted and vanished away. They melted and vanished and in their place I saw naught else but the master's face. And I cried aloud, oh, make me meek to follow the path of their bruised feet. My care is now for the souls of men. I've lost my life to find it again. Ever since that day in a quiet place, I met my master face to face. Jesus called his disciples. He called them. They were ordinary men who through the power of Jesus became extraordinary men. When called by Jesus, they immediately followed. Jesus is calling you and me. Will we answer that call? Look to him now. He's here and he's saying to you, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Let's pray. Lord of the harvest, as you called Simon, Peter and Andrew and James and John to follow you and made them fishers of men, they immediately responded to your call and followed you. Lord God, we ask you for the courage and conviction to follow you in our daily lives, that we may bring others to the saving message of your mercy and grace. Empower us to answer your call. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, as you called your disciples, so send faithful preachers and teachers of your gospel in our time. We especially ask that you lead both our pastoral call committee and our preschool director call committee to the persons that you have chosen to serve your church here at Trinity. We ask that you increase the spirit of generosity to all who support the missionaries, seminaries, colleges, and other institutions of our church for the spread of the gospel and the service of the church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal Lord, because of sin, we live in an uncertain world. There are natural disasters, discord, distrust, disdain for others. In view of every current distress, give constancy and contentment to your people in their God-given vocations. Give comfort and faithfulness to the married and strengthen them to pass on the faith to the next generation. Show kindness also to the unmarried and assure them of the holiness of their place in life that they would be freed from anxiety and attend to holiness in body and spirit, undividedly devoted to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, preserve our nation with its rulers. Call to repentance those who have forgotten you. Be with our president, our legislators, our judges, and all who serve for the good of your people. Do not let disaster overcome us, but preserve us in peace and quietness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, turn us from every distracting anxiety and the dealings of this world that would draw our hearts away from you. Give us confidence in the resurrection and peace of a clean conscience by the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. 
graciously uplift those who suffer in body and in mind. We pray for those who mourn, Lord. You hold them within your hands and see in it, see it all from the beginning to the end. Please keep and carry these precious people in their sadness and loss. Cover them with your love. Give their weary hearts rest and their minds sound sleep. Lord, lift their eyes so that they may catch a glimpse of eternity and be comforted by the promise of heaven. We especially pray for those who are dealing with the complications of cancer. When moments are of doubt or fear cause faith to weaken, strengthen, empower them with courage and endurance. As they work through their various protocols and procedures, give them strength and comfort. We pray for those who are facing upcoming medical procedure, surgery, or dealing with illness. For those facing upcoming surgery, give comfort and assurance of your presence that they may take care of all of their needs. As they look ahead, keep fear and trepidation from their thoughts, assured that their future is in your hands. For those recovering from surgeries, procedures, or tests, give them healing and a quick recovery. It seems long and painstaking, but lighten their hearts and spirits with renewed strength. Lord, we have many who are recovering from COVID. Give patience as strength returns ever so slowly, or so it seems. Help the vaccine to be distributed quickly and effectively so this virus is conquered and overcome. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As the Lord called and sent his apostles to be fishers of men, hear his voice and follow him. As we have received God's grace this day, for the sake of Christ our Lord, heed his call to repentance, rejoice in his forgiving grace, and give him thanks and praise. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant to you his peace. Amen. Just one quick little announcement here for, um, for everyone. Um, we're going to continue to have remote services for at least one more week. And then at that time, we will review where we are in this pandemic to, to uh, determine our next steps. Trust me, trust me when I say to you, I do not want you to catch this virus. I do not want any of you to have what I had. Our first concern is for your safety and we just don't want you to catch this disease. So stay tuned. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we go about our task this upcoming week, I'd ask that you think about how Jesus is calling you to be fishers of men.